Can you record from that other computer? I'm recording. Mr. Martin, please turn the host over to me. Yes. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone hear me okay? Morning. Yes. Morning. Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. We kind of set up this system yesterday, so praying that everything is going to go well. We decided to use an external camera and microphone so that we'll make sure that everyone can hear and everybody can see. Good morning again and happy Sabbath to each and every one. Happy Sabbath. 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 I want you to pray for me as I stand before God's people again. I say it's always an awesome responsibility to stand here before God's people. This morning, as we consider the message, the covenant and the gospel, righteousness by faith in motion. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for inviting us to be a part of your family. We thank you for your son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave his life that we might be able to be sons and daughters of thine. Father, I ask that you'll forgive our sins and that you'll bless us and give us understanding today as we consider the topic, the covenant, and the gospel. Strengthen our minds and our retention, we pray. And then, Lord, help us that we might be able to communicate these truths to others, that they, too, may come to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. For this, you declare, is eternal life. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> the covenant and the gospel. Our scripture reading today comes to us from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The word of God says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Brothers and sisters, the gospel simply means good news. And that good news is summed up in these words, and you can find it in John 3, verses 16 through 17. If you want to turn there with me, John, 16, John 3, 16 through 17. We should all be familiar with these verses. We use them every Sabbath when we do our services. The Word of God says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. 
What we may not realize is that there could be no gospel without the everlasting covenant. Therefore, we can say that the gospel is a heralding or heralding of the covenant or a declaration of the everlasting covenant. So the next logical question then is what is a covenant? Well, a covenant is an agreement between parties or a promise from one party to another. This agreement or promise may be conditional or unconditional. We will see that the terms of the covenant is of most importance as we look at the biblical covenant. So brothers and sisters, we know that before God created, the Bible tells us before God created this world, the scripture refers to Jesus in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So that tells us that before God created, there was already a plan in place. See, we understand that God being the omniscient God, knowing all things, the ends from the beginning. For God, there's no future, there's no past. God exists in eternity. So God knew that sin was going to raise its ugly head. And God had a plan how he was going to deal with the sin issue, how he was going to deal with the rebellion of Lucifer. And God understood, brothers and sisters, that what was going to happen, there was going to be a disinformation and misinformation campaign by the enemy. I say we live in, in some unique times today, for we're seeing how disinformation and misinformation can wreak havoc. Yeah, amen. People are deceived, even though the truth is right before them. Mm -hmm. You know, we are mystified, and I always wonder, how did the devil, how did Satan deceive one-third of the angels who dwelled in the presence of God? Mm -hmm. So we ought to be cautious, amen, because if he could deceive angels who dwell in the presence of God, and if we see what happened from the biblical narrative when Eve had a conversation with him, so we ought to be mindful, for we're only protected by the truth as it is in Jesus, and by the Spirit of God that dwells with his people. So we understand that because God know how sophisticated the attack was going to be, he had this plan in place, and the Bible refers to it as the everlasting covenant. It was an agreement within the Godhead that Jesus, the only begotten, would become one with the human family, and through him, God would set the record straight about himself. You know, I had a conversation with somebody lately, and I said, personally, I've decided that God's method works best. Amen? Amen. Or you see, brothers and sisters, I said this before, when the rebellion started in heaven, when this disinformation campaign started, God could have reverted and done what Satan did. And the only way he could have resolve the problem for himself, you would have to discredit the enemy. But God chose a better way, amen? Instead of trying to discredit the enemy through the everlasting covenant as it unfolds in the plan of salvation and the gospel, God decided to demonstrate, to show to the universe who he was. Amen. So we're going to see, and we got to bear this in mind, this is very important, a declaration or a revelation of the character of God. Amen? If you're there, let me hear you say amen. 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 There are several covenants amen. found in the Bible, amen. Uh, saints. However, we are going to look at five main ones as they appear in the Word of God. And the first one is the Edenic covenant. It's found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. We'll find that this is a promise, and there is no condition. It's, this is unconditional. In verse 14, the Bible says, So the Lord said to the serpent, this is after the fall, and God came and dealt with Adam and Eve, and now he's going to declare what's going to be done. He says, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity 
between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He, the seed, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Brothers and sisters, all Bible students agree in this, that this was the first, what we term the messianic promise. This was a promise of the coming savior and how God now is the first time he's beginning to reveal this everlasting covenant, this agreement between himself and his son. So the seed here is none other than Jesus the Christ. Amen. So brothers and sisters, if we look at the great controversy and we understand, we are told that even Satan was kind of taken aback when he started realizing this is the first glimpse that he truly got into the mind of God. And here God is really opening up and revealing his mind to us. So if the devil understood that the seed was going to crush his head, then he set out on a plan, and that plan was to stop the seed from coming. He had to do something so that God could not introduce his seed into the world. So we see what happened, amen? The Bible said that the human race became corrupt. And the Bible says that it was the imagination of man was sinful continually. And God sent a flood, the Bible said, and he destroyed all living things that breathe air. This is just a little bit of biblical history, amen? amen? And that brings us to our second covenant. It's referred to as the Noahic covenant, found in Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. And again, this is an unconditional promise from God. And its sign was the rainbow. Verse 8. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of our flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy our flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of our Amen. flesh that is Amen. on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is a sign which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Amen. So again, we see that this is an unconditional promise. Amen. God is the one who is making the promise to Noah and his family. He include all living creatures. And he declared that he will never again destroy this earth by a flood. Brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 26, it gives us the genealogy of Shem. For remember... We still got to remember, got to always keep in the back of your mind the seed. It's a purpose that God must bring this seed, which is Jesus, into the world. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, from Shem, Terah descended, and he is the father of Abram, Abram, who later was called Abraham by God, which means father of many nations. So we look at Genesis chapter 12. Again, my brothers and sisters, this is a non-conditional covenant. It's a promise that God made. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, God chose Abraham. Abraham did not choose God. Amen? Mm, right. God came to Abraham, the Bible said, and this is what he declared to him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get up out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, 
and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, we see it's another insight into the everlasting covenant. God is telling Abraham, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In Genesis chapter 17, there are several promises that God made to Abraham. Not going to spend a lot of time here, but we know that God promised him a son. And as time went by, Abraham didn't have a son. He went and tried to do things on his own. Listened to Sarah. He took Hagar as a wife. Had a child. And the story gets all messy from there. Amen. However, Amen. God declared to him that Ishmael was not supposed to be the heir. That's and he right. was right. going to have a son from Sarah. Yes. So we find out, brothers and sisters, that for one thing, Isaac who was this son, was a miracle baby. Yeah. Yes. We know that Jesus was also what? A miracle baby, amen? Amen. amen. Was born of a virgin. Mm -hmm. So God is the one who is doing all this. He don't need our help. He's taking care of his business. He's going to bring his seed into the world. And he chose Abraham as his man. And he blessed his family. Because we notice, brothers and sisters, right after the flood, again, the devil went about doing his business, trying to corrupt all men. And his purpose was, remember, to stop the seed from coming. Right. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1, when Abraham, when Abram was 90 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, Genesis chapter 17, for those who want to follow in their Bible, verses 1. The Bible says when Abram was 90 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked to him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Brothers and sisters, there's some controversy with this covenant because there are Bible students who believe and teach that God must fulfill this promise to Abraham, and they believe that this promise must come to the literal descendants of Abraham, which we know as a Jewish nation, is in, in Israel over there in Palestine. Well, as we continue studying, we'll find that from the very beginning, from the very inception, God did not set about just to bless a particular people. God's intention was to save the whole world. Amen? Amen. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was never God's intention just to save a nation or individuals. God simply uses individuals. And in the case of Israel, he uses a nation to declare and to present himself to the rest of the world. Remember at this time that most of the world had become corrupted. The nations were worshiping false gods and idols and the devil had corrupted them. Pastor Paul tells us that they were worshiping demons. The sign of this Abrahamic covenant, brothers and sisters, were circumcision. We, in verse 9 of the same verse, the, of the same chapter, the Bible says, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, and you and your descendant after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you will keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So we see at this time, right, God has added a condition to the covenant. And it was this sign that every male child was supposed to be circumcised. Let's move on. So we say that Isaac is a miracle baby. He's a child of promise. In Genesis 22, the Bible says in verse 15, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time. Brothers and sisters, this is now, remember, that Abraham, that Isaac is born. The Bible says that God came to Abraham, and he told him, Take your son, your only son, and I want you to journey, three days journey. And he told him where to go, and that he was supposed to sacrifice Abraham. I mean, sacrifice Isaac. The Bible says that Abraham listened to the voice of God, and this is where we come. We're in verse 15, and he was about to sacrifice Isaac, and the Bible says in verse 15, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, don't miss that again, the seed. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So here we have it, brothers and sisters. God again reiterating his promise to Abraham, and he says, I will do this, and in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. We know and understand that this seed is none other than the Messiah. This was a prophetic declaration of the Messiah's coming, none other than Jesus Christ himself. That brings us to the covenant that we want to spend a little time on, brothers and sisters. It's called the Mosaic or the Sinai Covenant. This one we'll find is conditional. We're not going to get into a lot of details on it. We could, it's a whole Bible study on its own. And its sign was the Sabbath. If you turn with me to Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 31, rather, verses 12 and 13. Sorry, that, that's where the sign is from, rather. In Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 and 13. I will turn there quickly. And here we find the Word of God says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So we find that the Sabbath is a sign of this covenant. If you will turn with me to Genesis, to Exodus chapter 19, I believe. For those of you who want to turn to their Bibles, in verse 19, in verse 1, rather, the Bible says, In the third year, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says, In the third year, in the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from 
Reb Hidim, and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you an eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And verse 7 says, So Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and he laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. And verse 8, should pay special attention to verse 8. Then all the people answered together and said, what did they say? All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Don't forget that. God gave his covenant to, Ab to Moses. Moses came down. The Bible says he told the people what the Lord says. And the people said, all that the Lord said, we will do. And then verse, the Bible goes on and says, So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whosoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So brothers and sisters, God is getting ready to do something very unique. God is going to come down on this earth for the first time in the history of mankind. And he is going to declare himself to this people. Bible says in verse 14, So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud. See, these are angels, brothers and sisters. If we use our spiritual imagination, could you imagine... God coming down from heaven with his retinue of angels. The Bible says the mountain was like on fire and you hear the trumpet blowing. These were, these were angelic, the angelic army coming down with God. Amen. I mean, it's an awesome thing just to think about what was going on. The Bible says the mountain was quaking. So the Bible goes on. There was thunderings and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Verse 17. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now the Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the Lord answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. So that brings us, brothers and sisters, to Exodus chapter 20 and verses 1 through 17. Now, I say for the first time in the history of mankind, 
God is going to do something. He's going to declare his law to the human race. Verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself the carved image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall, have, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them, all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Today we would say, you don't covet your neighbor's house, amen? <laughs> don't covet his car or her car. Be satisfied with what God has given you. We do live in a very covetous climate, amen? Everybody is just seeking, everyone is seeking. So my brothers and sisters, we understand that the Ten Commandments... I say is the most basic expression of what lie is, of what love is. God came down and he declared to the people what love is. This is how you're going to live. Love to God and love to your fellow men. I would also say because we believe that the law is an expression of who God is, and it's an expression or a declaration of the character of God, we can determine certain things. We know the, from reading the commandments that God is not a murderer. Amen. God is not an adulterer. Come on, man. He does not steal. Come he on. does not bear false witness. Uh -huh. and he doesn't covet. He has no need to covet. Amen. The Bible yeah. says the earth is the Lord and it's fullness thereof. Yes, sir. Settle on a thousand hills. It's all mine. Amen. Yes. So Amen. the law of God we see here is clearly Amen. declaring to the people to yeah. understand who God is. Amen. An expression of his character. So for the first time in the history of this world, God chose to give his law in written form, and he wrote it with his own finger and tablets of stone, we can say, that the Ten Commandments is an essay or a commentary on love. Amen. That's all right. Prior Amen. to this time, Amen. brothers and sisters, Amen. God Amen. had dealt with individuals, Adam and Eve, Noah and his family, Abraham. Now for the first time, he was making a covenant with a nation. To be more precise, a nation of ex-slaves. The word of God has informed us, brothers and sisters, that Abraham kept God's commandments. Genesis 26, verses 2 through 5. The, God, the Bible says that Abraham kept God's commandments. Turn with me there. Genesis 26. Well, let's read it for ourselves. Genesis chapter 26. And verses 2 to 5. There, let me hear you say amen. The word of God says, Then the Lord appeared to him and said, talking to Isaac here, 
Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which, of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 5, why? Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes and my laws. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us, give us details, but we can understand that Abraham had conversations with God, so God revealed his law to him. The Bible tells us here that clearly Abraham understood what God's law is and he kept them to the best. We know that no one is saved by keeping the law in. Righteousness by faith, the Bible says God, Abraham believed God and it was accredited unto him for righteousness. So here we find this time God declaring his law in the language of men, in the hearing of a people and writing them with his own finger and tablets of stone. So God's law informed us how to love. Love for God and love for each other. Furthermore, brother and sister, the word informs us that God is love. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 13, the Bible tells us that the Ten Commandments was the basis of the covenant. Let's move on. We also know that the earthly sanctuary was connected with this old covenant. So connected to the old covenant was the earthly sanctuary and its services. The word of God informs us that the sanctuary services was the gospel in picture form. Along with the priestly ministry and the participation of the people, the nation of Israel was daily acting out the plan of salvation, showing how God was going to deal with the sin problem and reconcile fallen man back to himself. So we know the story and the history. Israel failed miserably. Amen? Yes, yes. And if we're not careful, brothers and sisters, we too can fail miserably. Amen. Amen. Because we cannot keep God's law on our own. No. The Bible is very clear. We're not saved because we keep God's law. We save because we chose Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. <coughs> and then God comes to us and he dwells with us. He tabernacle with us. Through the dwelling power of the indwelling spirit. God, the Bible says, both will and work in us to do his good pleasure. So the Bible is very clear. Faith without works is dead. But the works is the fruit of the spirit. And the motive is not to be saved, but it's an expression of the saving connection, that saving relationship that we have with Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen? I want to make that clear. So we come to the new covenant. Now the new covenant is really older than the old covenant. Because the new covenant is the original covenant. That's the everlasting covenant. We, can, we found that in Jeremiah, the sign of the new covenant, the Bible tells us, is baptism. When Jesus was about to go to the cross in the upper room, he said, he broke the bread and the wine. He says, this is a sign, what, of my covenant, my broken body. So now I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. And we're going to read the whole chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1. Through 13. Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 through 13. Brothers and sisters, we are told that the plan of salvation, this declaration of this covenant that God made within the Godhead, this, this, this agreement that God made, is more than just for the salvation of men. Remember, we have to understand, we got to look at everything in the context of the great controversy. Satan had 
Rage War and I'm God's listening character. To a sermon. Right? Misaligning yeah. God's Rudy character. Mark. Mute the mics, Mutey. Rudy, mute the mics. Yeah, I'm here and I'm, I'm echoing to, to myself. So we have a progression uh, in the Edenic Covenant, the Noahic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, which was really the everlasting covenant, the covenant of promise. It was based on the seed who is Jesus Christ. Now we come to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Excuse me, brother. Brother Quentin, please mute your phone. Brother Quentin. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm trying to. We all know and understand that we're living, we are living under the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected on that man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. Talking about Jesus, amen? For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of heavenly things. So the Bible here is making us very clear to us that in the Old Covenant, and all the sanctuary service and the priestly service was a shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all the things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, talking about Jesus, inasmuch as he also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Remember that. The Bible says that the new covenant is a better covenant established on better promises. Why is that so? Because we find here in the new covenant, God is the one who is making all the promises. Amen? Amen. In the old covenant, the people says, all that the Lord has said what? We will do. We will do. And brothers and sisters, I don't believe it was God's intention that it should turn out that way. I just believe, you know, the people were hasty. You know, God, Moses came down and said, we will do. God says, okay, let's see how this is going to roll. Amen. But of course, God knew all this was going to happen. And he was going to use this to teach a lesson, not only to us, but to the entire universe. Bible goes on in verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them. Now, who is the them you think God is talking about here? Finding fault with them. The people, brothers and sisters. That's what the Bible is referring here to. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. I say, Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says, I will not remember their lawlessness. Praise the Lord. And their sins. I will remember no more. And in that he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. 
Brothers and sisters, it's very clear. We are told by the servant of the Lord that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Uh -huh. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. revealed. That's right, that's see, right. See, brothers and sisters, when you go and you start reading the Bible and start coming up with your own conjecture, that's where these people wind up. Unfortunately, I happen to be on a Bible study right now, unfortunately, by Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and they're teaching this kind of fallacy that God must fulfill his promise to Israel. But the Bible is very clear. The Old Testament is understood in the light of the New Testament. I'm going to read that statement again. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 19 through 25. Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through 25. What was the role of the law in the Old Covenant? Remember, God brought these children, the people out of Israel, out of Egypt rather, ex-slaves. He's introducing himself to them. He declares his law. We know that God's law is an expression of God's character. We also know that sin, the most basic understanding, or I should say the most basic definition of sin is what? Let's get a seven-day Adventist and they will tell you sin is the what? is the transgression of the law. You see, my, my brothers and sisters, as we read Galatians, we'll see what Paul is saying, that the role of the law in the old covenant, which was, was temporary, it was an administrative covenant, was supposed to inform the people of who God is, get them acquainted with his character, and at the same time, reveal what sin was, amen? You'll find that Paul makes statement in his, in his epistles, rather, that when the law came, sin became more what? More sinful. So what was the purpose of the law? Verses 19, Galatians chapter 3, verses 19. What purpose then does the law serve? This is a question that the Apostle Paul asked. He said, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Again, that seed. So the law was added because of what? Because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly no. not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. What is the Apostle Paul saying here? He says the law, brothers and sisters, and there was a debate in seven-day Adventism at one time among the scholars, the taught leaders of our church, which laws were included here in Galatians. There was those who said it was only the ceremonial laws. And there was those who said, well, no, the more laws was also included. The final understanding that is indeed Galatians is talking about the entire Torah. The ceremonial laws, all the laws are here included, including the moral law, the Ten Commandment law. The Bible says the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. What does a tutor do? What does a teacher do? It instructs us. So the Ten Commandments law, brothers and sisters, it instructs us two main things, I said. Who God is, his character, and also what sin is. The law instructs us of what sin was, made us become aware of our sinful nature, and then lead us to the Savior, 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith. The Bible Amen. says that now that faith has come, we're under the new covenant. We are no longer under a tutor. But what does that mean? Some would dare to say that under the new covenant is what been taught lately by these folks, that the law does not exist anymore. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not relevant anymore because Jesus is our substance. Amen? All, how can I find a kind word to express what I'm about to say? It's all fallacy, brothers and sisters. For you see, as we read the new covenant, the Bible is very clear. God says, I will what? I will write my laws in their hearts. The first time under the old covenant, God wrote his law on tablets of stone. The role of the law in the old covenant was our tutor, our instructor to lead us to Christ. So if the law is again included in a new covenant, why? Certainly the Bible says life does not come by keeping the law. So again, we find, brothers and sisters, as I was studying this, I realized and I believe I said, praise the Lord. Holy Spirit revealed this to me that the role of the law in the new covenant also has a role to play. This time, however, we find it in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 12. Turn with me in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 14, verses 12, so we can understand what the law plays in the new covenant. Amen? We're bringing this to an end. Romans chapter, sorry, Revelation chapter 14 and verses 12. The word of God says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I say contrary to what is teached today, that the law was done away with. Far from the truth, brothers and sisters. The law is again the basis of the new covenant. Only this time, I said, is it written in our hearts and in our minds. And its role this time is not to lead us to Christ. For Jesus has now appeared, amen? But instead, we find that the role of the law is to connect us with Christ, to identify us with him. What did the text say? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the law we find in the new covenant connects us to our Savior. It identifies us with him as his people, amen? If you understand that, let me hear you say amen. So again, Amen. we're not saved by keeping the law. The works of the law is manifested in our lives by God himself working out his good will and his good pleasure in us. So brothers and sisters, I am here to say the law can never be done away with. The Bible is very clear that Jesus, did not say, Jesus said he did not come to destroy the law, but to magnify the law. Amen. You know, the tragedy is Amen. that the folks who say, you know, lately I was told that, oh, you know, we don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore because the Sabbath is just, you know, the Sabbath is in the old covenant and, and, and the Jesus is the substance. So they say, oh, we don't, we, don't, we don't go by the letter of the law anymore. We go by the spirit of the law. You know, that's so ridiculous that kind of reasoning because think about this, brothers and sisters. If you violate the letter of the fourth commandment by doing your own menial labor and doing your own thing on the Sabbath day, how can you say that you keep the spirit of the Sabbath? Amen. You think about that for a minute. See, we do not keep the Sabbath to be saved. We keep the Sabbath as a sign of entering into God's rest. All right. Every time we cease from our labors on the seventh day, brothers and sisters, we declare to the world and we remind ourselves that we are connected with our Savior and that he is indeed our eternal rest and we have entered into the rest that is talked about in Hebrews chapter 3. This is the rest that the Bible says that the children of Israel did not enter into, even though the gospel was preached to them because it was not mixed with faith. So yes, 
the Sabbath is still relevant today. Amen. And I Amen. believe Amen. that the Sabbath is going to be the determining mark at the end of time that will be the mark that will set God's people aside from the rest of the world. Amen. 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 You know, in Sabbath school today, it was said that we don't know all the intricacies of how the prophecies are going to be fulfilled. But we know for one thing, I believe that we can say with confidence that it's going to be somehow, it's going to be connected with the true Sabbath and the counterfeit Sabbath. That for sure we can say with confidence. Now, there are others who may think otherwise. But for me, for this humble Bible student, I say, it's very clear, the mark of the beast and the sign of God is well laid out in the word yes. of God. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, like Israel of old, we're supposed to be ambassadors for heaven. Amen. Amen. And that's the reason why it is very important that we understand how we're saved and we ought to have confidence in the God that we serve, that we are indeed saved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And brothers and sisters, we ought to declare this to the world, amen? And we also have to live a life that demonstrates our belief. Amen. Faith, without works indeed is dead. Yes. But our works... It's not a works of salvation. It's a work that comes from the fact that we are in a saving relationship with our God. Amen? Amen. And our attitude must reflect that love for God and love for one another. Amen. Amen. As I said, by this, they shall know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for your word. You said to us, O God, test our spirits, for there are many spirits that have gone into the world. Thy word is truth. Give us understanding and give us wisdom, O God, not Amen. only for ourselves, but that we might be able to communicate these truths to others. Yes, Lord. That they too, O oh, Heavenly Father, may come to know thee, the only true God, mm. and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. For Amen. this, you declare, is eternal life. That they too, like us, may enter into the new covenant relationship with you in your Son, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and ask these blessings. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen.